Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Peter McGessen, discussing their latest book, Surviving Autocracy, in conversation with Joshua Rubenstein. Tonight's event is part of our ongoing virtual event series. We're so fortunate to be able to continue the work of bringing authors and their writing to our community during these difficult times. Every week, we'll be hosting events via Zoom. Just like always, our event schedule will appear on our website at harvard.com, where you can also sign up for an email newsletter for more updates. This evening's event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A button wherever it may live on your Zoom display, where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section of this presentation, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your copy of Surviving Autocracy. If you already have a copy of the book or would like to contribute to the series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation page. We greatly appreciate any and all support you are able to extend to us at this time. And lastly, as you may know, if you've participated in large virtual gatherings lately, technical glitches might come up. We apologize in advance for that. If any, if any technical issues do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. And now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Masha Gessen is a journalist, author, translator, and activist. They are writing on a number of intersecting subjects, including the politics of modern Russia, the global threat of autocracy, and LGBTQ rights has been published widely in a number of international publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Republic, and the New Yorker, where they have been a staff writer since 2017. The author of 11 books, they were awarded the National Book Award in 2017 for The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia. Joshua Rubinstein is an author, journalist, and a longtime associate of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University. As an activist and independent scholar, he has written extensively about various facets of Soviet history. His essays and articles have been featured in numerous publications, including The New Republic, The Nation, the Columbia Journalism Review, The New York Times, and elsewhere. He's the author of, editor of, and contributor to a number of books, including 2017's The Last Days of Stalin. Tonight, they will be discussing Masha's latest book, Surviving Autocracy, an urgent, blunt, and irreplaceable document of not only stolen and corrupt systems that got us here. When Donald Trump was arguably elected in 2016, Many regarded his unlikely ascent to the presidency as an anomaly. Surviving autocracy, Masha Gessen urges readers to dispose of this notion, identifying the flaws in the design of American democracy, which made the presidency ripe for a demagogue of enormous wealth, authority, and danger. I will end with an observation from Hari Kunzru in the New York Times Review of Books, who raves that, quote, surviving autocracy sharpens an edge of disgust lately blunted by relentless use. At a time when there is so much to mourn, we are so fortunate to have thinkers like Masha and Joshua to keep us persistent. We're so incredibly honored to host this event tonight. Without further ado, I will now turn things over to Masha and Joshua. Benjamin, thank you. Thank you very much. And Masha, it's great to see you. Congratulations on your book. Thank you. And it's great to see you in this format. Sure, of course. Let me start with a question where we go back to November 2016. A few days after the election, four years ago, you published an essay entitled Autocracy, Rules for Survival. Your five rules instructed us to believe the autocrat, don't be taken in by small signs of normality, institutions will not save us, be outraged, don't make compromises, and remember the future. That's six, actually, yes. Now, nearly four years later, your new book, Surviving Autocracy, is a clarion call about how Trump continues to threaten our democracy. Is it too early to say if American democracy can or will survive his sustained assault on our traditions and institutions? Um, thank you, Joshua. So a couple of things. I mean, I, um, you know, we use the word democracy uh, and the phrase American democracy as though it were a, know, a knowable and known thing, right? And, um, and as though what we had to do was just 
bring it back to normal, to this imaginary pre-Trump uh, normal where everything was fine and everything was not fine. You know, everything um, was in such condition that it made Trump possible. I don't think it made Trump inevitable, but I think it made Trump possible. And that's part of the argument of the book is that, you know, I'm not saying that he was predetermined, but I'm also saying that he's not anomalous. Um, so I'm, I'm just really careful about using the word democracy to imply that democracy is anything but a process, anything but an aspiration, an ongoing negotiation, right? An ideal that we're going toward, right? Um, uh, and I would rephrase the question as, is it possible for us to return to that aspiration? Is it possible for us to return to living in a society that enfranchises more of its people with, uh, with the passage of time rather than fewer of them? I think it's, at this point, it's not, it's not too late. Um, at this point, the damage that's been done to American institutions is extensive, but we have the November election, and at least until the November election, at least theoretically, we're able to end this particular period of history by peaceful electoral means. Let me move to one of the major points of your book. You point to the work of the Hungarian sociologist Balint Magyar. His analysis of how Viktor Orban has managed to undermine the fragile democratic institutions of his country, of Hungary. He calls Hungary a mafia state. I would think Americans would be disturbed by the idea that Magyar's analysis could apply to what we are experiencing here. Has there been some pushback on your comparing Trump to Viktor Orban? I don't really compare Trump to Viktor Orban, but um, you know what I do do is I go to uh, I use Magyar's work um, and not so much his work on the mafia state as his work on autocracies. Um, now Magyar is he is one of my intellectual heroes. He's really a brilliant thinker and researcher, and he says something fairly simple to begin with. Right, he says that in 1989 when the Eastern Bloc collapsed. We started using the language of liberal democracy to describe what was going on there for two reasons. One is that we just assumed that that's what was going to happen, right? Everything was going to become a liberal democracy. It was the end of history. And two, because that's the language of political science. That's the vocabulary. That's the, that's the system of thinking that's available to us. And he says, if you use those metrics to try to describe something to which they don't actually apply, you know, if you ask whether there are free and fair elections, if you ask where there's free, where the, there's free media, you may be pointing to the things that are lacking or things that are restricted, but you're not actually describing the thing itself, right? Or as he says, the, you might say that the elephant can't fly, you might say that the elephant can't swim, but you're not describing the elephant. And yes, I know that elephants can swim, but you know, in our example, they can't. Um, so he suggested that we need to come up with a new system of thinking to wrap our minds around post-communist regimes. And so actually in his current book, which is The Anatomy of Post-Communist Regimes, which is this 800 page tome that just came out, um, he proposes a really, really detailed um, taxonomy and a really detailed way of applying language and many different models, right? Some of which are completely not applicable to our situation, and some of which are somewhat applicable to our situation, and some of which actually are remarkably accurately applicable to our situation. And you know, that's how models work. You, you, you borrow something from, uh, that was developed for, for, for another place, and you see how much of it is useful in illuminating what we're witnessing, right? Models are always abstract, they're always ideal by the time that you're applying them. But what my argument is that that language and that way of thinking is actually more useful in some ways than the language of liberal democracy. And in particular, what I use is his idea that um, autocracy comes in three stages. 
that the first stage, stage is an autocratic attempt, the next stage is autocratic breakthrough, and then the third stage is autocratic consolidation. And the autocratic attempt is the period when autocracy is still reversible by electoral means. So I'm using the assumption that we're witnessing an autocratic attempt at this point. Well, certainly the 2018 election where the Democrats took control of the House and did manage to impeach Donald Trump uh, was certainly a very strong pushback, which he survived because of a supine Senate. Um, well, exactly. You know that. So there was there we see that uh, that that particular very you know decisive attempt to remove him from the presidency for what I think you know was established very well were impeachable offenses failed because of how, the extent to which he has already succeeded in consolidating power. Um, and I also think that there's something really important about the impeachment process, which is that the White House was able in violation, not only of norms, but of the law, to refuse to, 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 uh, to participate in the impeachment process, to ban employees from testifying in Congress, to refuse to supply evidence to Congress, uh, refusals that were actually legally punishable and got away with it. So that's one measure that we have, an extremely vivid measure of the extent to which our legal framework has already been damaged. Well, the legal framework has been watered down because the courts have not stood up to Trump in a systematic, forceful way. And if without the Senate helping the House, it seems that our institutions are very hamstrung in the face of a, bad, a badly acting president acting in bad faith. So how do we assure a president would act in good faith, even if we disagree with their political ideas? Uh, we can't. We can't assure that. That's, um, and that's exactly why, or that's one of the reasons why I think it's, uh, it's counterproductive to think of democracy as something that is built and then just exists, right? Um, no set of laws, no dis institutional design can withstand a bad actor, right? That hasn't been invented. In the United States, we have this almost religious faith in our institutions. We imbue them with magical qualities. We imbue them with the magical quality of self-repair, and we imbue them with the magical quality of being able to act in a vacuum. In fact, that's not how things work, and it's not how American institutions work. And the Trump presidency should have, sh should have shown us that. So unless we can come together in a democratic process, unless we can return to a democracy that is a negotiation, that involves the people of this country, that is in fact the government of the government, um, we will, you know, we may see repetition of bad actors and bad acting, Ad infinitum. You know, one of the um, major points about the Trump presidency is his proclivity to lie all the time, to avoid the truth. In, in your book, Surviving Autocracy, you delve into the dilemma our media faces over when and how to point out in explicit language that Trump was lying repeatedly and shamelessly. How do you think our media should have handled this challenge from the beginning and done it differently? You know, um, I hope this comes across in that section of the book. I mean, it's, it's, it's a third of the book is about language and media and what has happened to language and media uh, under Trump. And um, I hope it comes across that it's, I don't think that what ha primarily what has happened in media is a series of mistakes or bad judgments. It's a terrible situation. A lying president is an existential threat to journalism. Right? Um, it's, it, is, it is a constant sort of process of entrapment because you can't not report presidential tweets, presidential lies, or meaningless statements 
because they have real life consequences. You know, some examples are his ban, uh, his tweet announcing the, the ban on transgender people in the military. Right? At first there was this sort of reaction, well, uh, he can't really tweet that out, right? This was in ancient times before we realized that policy could in fact be made by tweet. Right? But, but in fact, he's the commander in chief, he can make, he can issue commands in any way he wants, including by tweet. And that tweet had, it has had extreme, you know, real life consequences for right. thousands of Americans. Another example is the president saying that you should use uh, chlorine bleach intraven intravenously to prevent mm -hmm. the coronavirus and then saying that he was kidding. But by the time he said he was kidding, poison centers around the country were overwhelmed with phone calls from people who had either done it or were thinking of doing it, right? Real life consequences of statements that on the face of it are meaningless, right? Are ridiculous and absurd. So um, how do you report that in a way that doesn't normalize it, doesn't validate it as policy, and yet reports on it acknowledging the real life consequences? That's an extremely complicated, almost impossible problem. I think there are better ways of handling, but there's no good way of handling it. Um, you think the media waited too long to use the word outright lies for Trump? Well, I mean, the media is not monolithic. I think uh, I single out two institutions that have clear policies on using the words lie and racist. Okay. The uh, NPR has had a policy of not using the word lie and a policy of not using the word racist, which they broke with partially a year ago after he told the squad to go back where they came from. Mm -hmm. Now, um, they're, uh, their justification of not using the word lie is that they, uh, because the dictionary defines lying as an intentional act of deception, and they can't know the president's intentions because they can't peer inside his head or his heart or whatever, um, they can't use the word lie. And I think that's ridiculous. That's actually abdicating our responsibility as journalists because if we know that what he's saying is not true. And if we know that he consistently repeats things that are not true, not only does he, does he say things that are not true every day, he also says the same things that are not true time and time and time again, right? That is actually enough to deduce that he knowingly and intentionally is lying. Also, he lies about the weather, another indication that he is doing this knowingly. Like he knew when he said that the sun came out when he was giving his inaugural speech, he knew it did not come out that day. He knew that he, was, that he gave his speech in the rain. So, so now, you know, that's, that's just bad journalism. The New York Times has had a slightly more nuanced policy where they sometimes use the word lie, but a lot of the time they will use Synonyms, synonyms or what they think of as synonyms and I think of as euphemisms. And I think that's a terrible policy because it, in effect, it raises the bar, right? The lie has to be so bad to be called a lie that it actually serves to normalize the smaller lies, the less outrageous lies, the less egregious lies. So I think the word lie should be, should be used consistently. Yes. Well, then Speaking about language, your book led me back to George Orwell, famous essay, Politics and the English Language. Orwell published this piece in 1946, in the wake of World War II, the beginning of the Cold War, and the ongoing horrors under Stalin. I'd like to recall one sentence from his essay and ask if it seems germane to our current crisis. Orwell wrote, Political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable. Is that too extreme a description of what we're facing? Um, no, I don't think it's too extreme, although I think it's maybe too dignified, right? Um, because I think there, there, there are different sorts of lying, right? That, um, 
that 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 we're in different kinds of political language that we are being um, confronted with. And what Orwell was referring to was rather the language used in in the public sphere, uh, not necessarily by the politicians, by by, by you know the despot himself. Right? Um, so this is more the language that, for example, the New York Times again uses when it describes Trump's tantrums as policy or as diplomacy, diplomacy, right? And again, it's a very, very complicated problem because, in effect, in their sort of, uh, in their life as executive speech, his statements are policy. His statements are diplomacy, right? That's what we get. Right. But by writing about them as a policy, we normalize them. And that's almost inevitable. I think we can only think of mitigation strategies for that. We can't entirely avoid it because, yes, this man is president. You know, in the book, you refer to statements by uh, the new representative in Congress from Queens, Ocasio-Cortez, when she takes a moral stand against Trump, not simply just describing what he says is lies, pointing out with moral outrage the conduct of how we're handling refugees at the border with Mexico and elsewhere, that this seems to, to raise the level of rhetoric as a way to lance the boil of Trump's lying, of Trump's policies. Is that a, one of your main recommendations to us and what we face today? Well, in general, my recommendation is, is moral aspiration. You know, I think that um, that aspiring to retreat to a pre-Trumpian past is, is a losing strategy, but I think that, that emotionally and politically what, what made Trump possible was that he made a promise of, of a return to an imaginary past, right? It's a kind of nostalgia, and we know this from demagogues around the world and uh, you know, current demagogues and 20th century demagogues who who promised to take an anxious public back to a time before they lived in fear for the future, right? Back to a time uh, when, 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 they, when they felt comfortable, when they felt sure of tomorrow. And I think that the way you counter that is by conjuring the image of a glorious future. Right? You, don't, you don't counter it as I think Democrats have mistakenly done, uh, or uh, or done, you know, uh, mistakenly as, an, as it's a, strat a strategic mistake by saying no, no, the present is fine. Like this is this is very good, because that doesn't speak to those anxieties. What speaks to those anxieties, which are absolutely real, is the language of aspiration, right? And I think that the way that Alexandria Ocasio Cortez speaks, and several other politicians that I write about in the in the, in, the, in the book. Who, try, who really seem to, to get Trump's goat when they speak, right? Um, is they speak about us like we could be better, like our society could be better, like we could be better toward one another, like we could um, acknowledge and inhabit our interdependence and care for one another. Right? And that just really drives you crazy because that is in fact the opposite of what he proposes. Well, that's the language of social solidarity in a way. It is absolutely. I mean, that's part of it, is the, la the language of, of social solidarity that is future-oriented. That brings me to a question I have relating to your previous book and a little bit about Russia today. When I read your previous book about Russia under Vladimir Putin, the title is The Future is History, one section resonated strongly with me that young people in particular were losing hope that anything in Russia, in their country, could possibly change for the better. Now Putin has taken things to an even greater extreme, making it likely that he is becoming president for life. But is it, but is it always fair, at least in the context of Russian history, to see a situation as utterly hopeless? After all, if there could have been a public opinion survey in the former Soviet Union in 1950 or 1951, during the final years of Stalin's life, and if people would have dared to answer candidly, wouldn't they too have responded that there is nothing to hope for? 
And yet, as soon as Stalin died, as soon as Stalin died, the era of outright terror came to an end. And a famous period, the thaw ensued. Isn't there a lesson here for Americans as well as Russians? The pendulum does swing one way and the other. Absolutely, but the pendulum doesn't swing on its own. I mean, I think that you are absolutely right. And I, you know, that's something that I love about your book, The Last Days of Stalin, um, is it's so, it makes it so clear that, um, um, that for, uh, among others, American foreign policy specialists under Eisenhower, were, they just didn't have the imagination to understand how much was possible, right? And I think that's one of the great lessons of, of those turning points in history, was that we really have to exercise our imagination to know how much is possible, right? And so I think, you know, the book came out before the, the current uprising, but I think, you know, without being too modest, it kind of prefigures it because, I, you know, it talks about that sort of, um, uh, that kind of conversation being absolutely necessary as an antidote to Trump, right? And I think that it, it not only is it necessary, but it's possible. And what makes it possible is that we're living in a time of crisis, right? Things, can, things are very, very bad and can get much worse, but they can also, because we're in a time of crisis, get much better. And I think what we have seen over the last month and a half is exactly what we see in moments of, of incredible political opportunity, which is that ideas that seemed marginal that under normal circumstances would have taken years, possibly decades, to be sort of absorbed into mainstream conversation, just leap over right, from the margins into the center, like ideas of defunding the police, ideas of abolishing the police, ideas of restorative justice, um, ideas even of, of universal basic income, you know, ideas that, that really, like uh, a couple of years ago, uh, or some of them a few weeks ago, seem completely nutty, are now not necessarily accepted by everybody as a great idea, but are part of the conversation. Yes, well that brings me exactly to what I wanted to talk about next. In the prologue and epilogue to your book, there was time to reflect on how Trump could use the COVID-19 pandemic, which had only started to overwhelm us all for his own purposes. But since that time, another unforeseen crisis in our political culture has emerged. The killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, the hands, or should I say the knee of a police officer. And this has provoked an enormous outpouring of support for the Black Lives Matter movement and an insistence on holding police accountable. Could it be that far from helping Trump consolidate power, the pandemic, and now all the public outrage and mobilization associated with Black Lives Matter is helping expose his incompetence and self-serving approach to everything he touches? Yes, and I think that Unfortunately, both things can be true at the same time. Um, I think that certainly the pandemic has shown many of us just what kind of damage an incompetent, militantly competent presidency can do. Militantly incompetent and, and you know, explicitly cruel presidency can do. We knew about that before the coronavirus. But now we're seeing that it, uh, the circumstances under which it can actually cost tens of thousands of lives. Right? So yes, absolutely, it, the pandemic exposes it. But I think it also, at the same time, creates certain conditions that may help him get reelected. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's like the Russian joke about the software engineer who goes to bed with two glasses of water on his nightstand, one full of water and one empty, you know, one in case he wants to drink and one in case he doesn't want to drink. Um, so uh, it's, it's one or the other, but I think, I think we're seeing two extreme uh, processes going on at the same time. And I just don't want us to get complacent because of, of the protests, because, you know, because we've seen the, the largest 
protest movement in American history. Because Biden seems to be leading by double digits, we're still more than 100 days out from the election. And, and there's a set of forces that may or may not be equal and opposite that, that, um, that mitigate for, for his reelection. When you wrote your prologue and epilogue, you finished the book, Last sections you wrote, I believe. I think you initially felt that the pandemic would suit would suit Trump, that it would serve his purposes. Did you really have that fear back in February and early March? Um, well, actually, I, I did have that fear, and I still have that fear. Also, I have to say, I mean, the whole book was reworked in April. Uh, really? I, yeah, you may have read the version that just had um, that, that didn't have COVID in it, but no, I rewrote the whole book for for. COVID um, in, uh, yeah, and I, I, I somehow managed to convince the publisher to give me, uh, when, the, when the book was already in proofs, to actually go through the entire book and, uh, and, and rework it for, for COVID. For, unfortunately, you know, uh, it didn't change anything substantially, uh, but it was largely a matter of inserting examples into all the different uh, chapters of the book of, 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 of all the same things that I was discussing as they manifested um, during COVID. So, you know, the incompetence, the, the, the media coverage, the, um, the disregard for, for human life and, the, you know, the, uh, this hateful uh, presidency. But it's my job, you know, to both, uh, I mean, I think the, the book actually ends in a hopeful note, right? Yes, uh, it does. Of, of this, this, this idea of what might be possible in the future, of the ways in which it's, um, it's, a, it's a time of opportunity, but it also contains some warnings about how the pandemic can help him. And there are two basic ways that it can help him. One is that, um, you know, it, it has served to basically annihilate politics, right? Um, there, and, and this is still largely the case uh, four months into the pandemic. There are no school board meetings. There are no city councils. There's no, aside from the protests, right? There's no regular political and social life that actually is our strongest bulwark against, against autocracy. Right? right, we're all sitting um, at home. We're all sitting at home. We have retreated out into our private spaces. Um, there is no politics. There's no ongoing conversation um, between people in, in the same physical space about how we live together in this country. Right? And the other, uh, the other thing that can unfortunately help him is that the sense of, of dread, the sense of high anxiety, and the sense of scarcity, they, these things actually can benefit an autocrat who's trying to consolidate power. You know, it's not the same metrics of um, if, we, if, if a democratically elected leader in what we think of as a functioning democracy shows his utter incompetence and people live worse under his rule, you know, they tend to, to vote him out of office. It is the exact opposite with autocrats. The worse things are, the better it is for consolidating power. Right now, if the polls are to be believed, around 40% of the country remain strong supporters of Donald Trump. This is a significant portion of our population, our civic culture. You and me as a con artist, without engaging in patronizing rhetoric, understand what draws their fervent support. What does their support say about our civic culture? Um, well, I think that he does speak to a deep and abiding anxiety. And, you know, we live in a, in a time of extreme economic insecurity. We live in a time of the displacement of people, right? These are the conditions that have given us autocracy, uh, you know, in the 20th century, in the early 21st century. And the United States is not an exception. The sense of profound insecurity, the sense of profound disconnectedness, the sense of not being cared for is what makes the appeal of somebody who says, I will take you back in time to when you felt better. 
almost irresistible. Right? And it makes the burden of having to invent your future to, to chart your own path when you don't have the, the, the tools, you know, that makes that, that, that burden un, unbearable. So that's, that's sort of the precondition. I think also the three and a half years of Trump's presidency, um, they're very difficult to live through when you're trying to constantly inhabit the space where there's sort of fact-based reality and there's Trump's reality. And the alternative is to give up and just move into his reality. You no longer have to, to, to struggle cognitively. You no longer have to feel ashamed of what you see and hear. You can just go live there. Um, and you know, I, I hope that doesn't sound too condescending because in a sense, I think we can all understand that emotional impulse. And, and I don't, you know, I'm not sure that the other side is offering a great alternative. Well, I, nonetheless, I think we have to contend with the fact that the country is divided and polarized. And even under President Obama, who was in some ways a, a figure of conciliation, tried to tone down the rhetoric, you know, no drama Obama, but I think because he was black, that led to greater polarization, which Trump was able to exploit. I mean, it's such an enormous contract, personal contrast, personally between the two of them, uh, that it to me was such a shame that Obama was succeeded by Trump, who had risen to prominence by lying about his birth. Right. Such a terrible insult. Absolutely. Right, our institutions have not adequately met the challenge posed by a president who continuously acts in bad faith. Does that make our upcoming national election the last standing mechanism to hold Trump accountable? It may well be. It may well be. I mean, he has already set a record for appointing the number of federal judges. Even if he is voted out of office, on an institutional level, it will take a long time and a lot of reinvention to, to recover from the effects of Trumpism. Um, so the amount of damage that he will be able to do if he is reelected or if he's able to not recognize an electoral loss, right, uh, which is also a possibility, you know, that, that, that damage will probably be greater than what he has, the damage he has done in the last three and a half years. That's a pretty pessimistic picture. Well, I hope it's a call to arms. It's, you know, everyone has to get out and, walk, and vote. <laughs> in your view, how does our political culture have to change in a post-Trump America, should we ever get there sooner or later? Can, can we recover a shared reality? Uh, I think we can recover a shared reality. It will, but it will take a lot of imagination and a lot of, of really radical work. I mean, one, one thing, and I could, there are so many things to talk about, but let me focus on just one aspect of it, which is um, we can't possibly recover a shared reality if we don't re rebuild local media, which have gone basically extinct. They were almost extinct before the pandemic, and now I think we can, we can pretty much declare them extinct. And the consequences of that are absolutely dire. I mean, the consequences of that are that um, people don't actually have a personal connection to politics. People don't actually have a way, unless they get you know, uh, seriously involved in, say, the local Democratic Party politics, everyday inhabitants of this country uh, cannot find a connection to the conversation you know, about how we live together. Uh, it also means that nobody knows a journalist personally, except for people who are also journalists. Um, and that creates the, the uh, that has created the opportunity for Trump to paint the media as the enemy of the people, has created the impetus for the police to attack uh, to attack journalists working at protests, you know, among other symptoms of how strong that has been. And if we can't have a media that people generally trust, we can't have politics. We can't have any kind of democratic uh, politics. And we're not going to be able to rebuild local media if we just leave it up to 
private companies to invent another way for, you know, for capitalism to suddenly meet the need of people to, uh, to have politics. There was an accidental coming together in the 20th century of the need for advertising vehicles and the, the need for local news. And that's not going to happen again. And so unless we actually have a national conversation and national policy and tax money going to creating local media, we're not going to be able to reclaim a sense of shared reality. And that's just, just, just one aspect of the, uh, and one example of the scale in which things will need to be done. Well, I very much appreciate your referring to local media. There's so much attention now the New York Times is doing and CNN and Washington Post and the role of Fox News and its affiliates. Uh, there's so much attention to the titans of the media, which are thriving actually, and the disappearance of our local media and our local civic culture, which the media so much helped to shape. Is that something you have much contact with? Local? Well, there isn't anything really to have contact with, with anymore. Right. right. Um, but it's, some, it's something I certainly... Um, keep track of and, and, and teach a lot actually is, um, is thinking and, um, and understanding the role of, of, of local media in politics. Well, Masha, this has been great speaking with you. I know we have a lot of questions from our audience. We'll ask Benjamin to come back on and help okay. to moderate the questions. Good luck to you and again, congratulations. Thank you so much, Josh. It's great to talk to you. You bet. Hello, everyone. I'm back. Um, and yes, we have quite a few questions from the audience. I'm going to start with one from audience member George, um, who asks, hypothetically speaking, if the Democrats win the presidency, the Senate and the House, what should be the government's top five priorities in order to strengthen democratic institutions? I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. That's like that. That's actually a policy question. I'm not a policy person. And uh, and that's a very specific question. Like, I would have to spend a few days thinking about the okay. top five areas. Sure thing. Um, so let's move on to this wonderful question from, sorry, so many questions are coming in, they're shifting. Um, do you see the Trump, so this is from audience member Allison, who asks, do you see the Trump takeover of the Justice Department and the Senate as a primary movement from the autocratic attempt stage to the next stage of autocracy. Thus far, they have effectively shut down the judicial system as a way to challenge Trump's corruption and mendacity, both in his personal and in his political worlds. Um, well, I think that actually, uh, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't go quite so far as to say that they have effectively shut down the judicial system, but he has certainly, um, he has certainly made the Justice Department uh, a part of his presidency to the extent that the Justice Department, even though it was always in the executive branch, you know, has never functioned or certainly hasn't functioned in living memory. Uh, he, has, he has used the Justice Department to settle scores, to, um, to, um, you know, to, uh, to circumvent justice, to circumvent court decisions, and he has also packed the courts and he has also used the courts in bad faith. All of these things are parts of the autocratic attempt. I mean, that's part of that. That's actually part of the diagnosis. That process will continue if he uh, retains the presidency after November, as we move from autocratic attempt to autocratic consolidation, which I hope doesn't happen. Great, thank you so much. So here is another question um, from spoke about how the previous situation, so I guess that came before, enabled the phenomenon of Trump. What would you point to particularly and how would you change it? Which I guess is another policy question, but how would you like to answer it? <laughs> um, so what I would point to in particular, and you know, I think that um, there are two ways to, uh, to tell the story of Trump. And one way, which I think is more common, is to sort of talk about him as anomalous as an alien, as somebody who you know, just came from outer space or, or the Russians put him there. Right? 
Um, and that's kind of the more common narrative. There's a non-common narrative, but but it, it's out there. Um, but no, he's just like a normal Repo Republican president. He is what was going to happen anyway. And I actually think you have to tell those two stories at the same time. He's both anomalous and the um, as an American president, and the groundwork for his creation was laid in the decades and years before he was elected. Now that story about how groundwork was laid, you can also tell it in a couple of ways. Um, uh, I would tell it this way. I would say that the post 9-11 transformation of the state and our uh, self-identity played a huge role, which is that you know, the concentration of power in the executive branch the creation of the internal surveillance state um, and the creation of an American identity as a nation under siege, as, an, as, as a land against the world, as you know, always having to be on the lookout and, and the defensive. Uh, those things are hugely important in understanding how Trump could happen. Something else that can, is hugely important in understanding how Trump uh, could happen is the marriage of money and politics. Money has never been really kept separate from politics in American history, but that process has accelerated so drastically in the last 20 years. And the amount of money and the ways in which money is wielded in American electoral politics has become so extreme that perhaps it was only a matter of time before somebody who um, maybe didn't have a whole lot of money to spend, but who positioned himself as an agent of money. Right? What, uh, somebody who you know, very crassly sort of portrayed that, that marriage of money and politics got elected president. Thank you so much. So we've gotten quite a few questions um, that sort of seek comparisons between Trump and, and other sort of autocratic rulers of today, but also of the past. So I'm going to sort of hopefully synthesize as best as I can, but um, I'll, I'll sort of use the question posed by audience member Meredith, who asks, while Trump has much in common with many of the rising and strong autocratic rulers of today, his striking lack of intelligence seems to make him somewhat of an outlier. How would you compare someone like Putin who is shrewd with clear goals in mind to a leader like Trump? I think that's, um, um, that's a faulty assumption. Putin is an idiot. You know, he is, uh, he, and that's, it's, it, it's, it's funny because in 2012, I published a book about Putin called The Man Without a Face, The Unlikely Rise of Vladimir Putin. And it was certainly very well reviewed, but almost all reviewers at some point or another uh, would kneel me for claiming that Putin is uneducated, uncurious, uninformed, and basically like, profoundly mediocre. Uh, and and would kind of say, well, somebody who is that stupid couldn't possibly accumulate that much power. And I have to say that after Trump was elected, I thought, well, at least now they'll know that yes, somebody who is that stupid can absolutely be elected president, even of the United States. Um, I think distance can make villains look more shrewd and more, more cunning and more intelligent than they are in real life. And I, by that, I mean both physical distance, like from here to Russia or, or Hungary or Turkey or, or India, or, uh, and historical distance, right? From here to Stalin, from here to Hitler. If you read contemporary accounts of the great despots of the 20th century, you will find that, one, uh, that a consistent theme is that you know, they're incoherent, they're unintelligent, that, uh, that their appeal is, is to the basest instincts and their speech is, is, is most elementary and, and, and kind of primitive. It's the only thing that's scarier than thinking that we're being guided into a very dark period of history by, some, by an evil genius is thinking that we're just stumbling into a very dark period of history uh, under the rule of, 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 of somebody very, very dumb, but that's exactly what's happening, not just here. Thank you so much for that. 
um, clarification. So here is a question from audience member Francis, and I will begin the question which begins with praise. Um, so Masha, thank you for this book. The ideas are urgent and serious, but you also have a great way of bringing humor into your analysis. This week, many found the absurdity of Trump and his daughter Ivanka almost cynically posing with Goya products as a way to amplify the Goya CEO's support for the regime, pretty humorous. Are there any amusing analogs to this kind of bizarre boosterism that you've witnessed in Russia or hung with autocrats or aspiring autocrats like Trump? Um, this is the sort of thing that's very hard to produce on cue. I mean, uh, I'm sure that after we hang up, I'm going to think of lots and lots of examples. <laughs> but, um, but yes, I think ridiculousness is, is, is part of the spectacle. I mean, it's an embarrassing kind of ridiculousness. And I think that that's part of what creates a media problem, right? Um, I mean, normal mainstream media are used to writing about everything and telling them extreme restraint of, of speaking about things with a straight face. And some of the stuff you can't think about, uh, you can't talk about with a straight face. I mean, those pictures, the picture of the president, you know, with that smile and two thumbs up uh, against the background of the gold velvet curtains and the stars and stripes with the Goya pro products arrayed in front of him. Um, how do you even talk about that with a straight face? And I think that that's part of um, what has made late night comedy so important because there is a way that, you know, because they're not wedded to the standard of extreme restraint and neutrality, they can just call things as absurd as they are. Um, to me, that level of absurdity is actually a sign that we are, you know, significantly in an autocracy. Uh, because I certainly know that uh, I wrote a piece many, many years ago about how political satire in Russia had kind of gone extinct, not because it was censored, but because how could you perform the satirical act of taking something to its logical extreme so that it seemed absurd when it was already taken to its logical extreme in, in real life? life? It was already absurd, right? Um, and so to me, that's um, as ridiculous and sort of as much of a relief it is to, to, to watch the late night comedy shows, it's also a, a, a sign of, of real trouble. Great. Um, so I'm going to try my best to synthesize this question as well, um, which has to do, I think, a lot of the questions you need pointing in the direction of what you were talking about earlier about political annihilation um, and going into a period when it's harder to sort of politically practice. Um, so we have a lot of questions about the November election and if you have sort of any thoughts about that. <laughs> um, well, so uh, one thought uh, that, that I have obsessively about that is that he has clearly laid the, the groundwork for not recognizing the results of the vote. Right? Uh, he has tweeted obsessively about people voting illegally. He has tweeted about voter, imaginary voter fraud. He's tweeted about uh, vote by mail being invalid, right? Considering that we're having, I mean, you wouldn't even have to consider this, but what, what makes it even worse was that we're having an election in a pandemic. I think uh, barring some sort of scientific miracle, much of the country ought to be in lockdown at the time of the election, uh, whether mandated or voluntary because the governors can't take enough responsibility. Um, so a lot of the vote will be by mail, which will make it even easier for him to claim that, uh, that the, vote is uh, the results of the vote are invalid. And so we really have to think about, learn to think about this country as a country where this might happen, where the sitting president might refuse to leave office after being voted out of it. And when we game that out for, Assuming that this is the kind of country where this could happen, we ask, okay, who is the military with? Who are the uniformed services with? Is he going to get escorted out of office? And that leads us to the question of perceived legitimacy. Uh, and perceived legitimacy is, by what margin is he voted out of office? 
if he loses by the same kind of margin that he won by in 2016, he's not leaving. Right? We need to vote him out of office by millions of votes and a landslide in the Electoral College. That will create the sense of legitimacy that will get him escorted out of the White House. Many of the questions mention the possibility that he would refuse to leave, so I'm glad you, I'm glad you included that. Um, so we have time for one more question. So I'm going to present a question um, from audience member Marcy, who asks, is there an example we can look to as of an autocracy that has been successfully dismantled after it has been achieved? And if not, what factors do you think need to be there for it to happen? Um, well, you know, <clears throat> It seems like a strange time to point to Eastern and Central Europe, where uh, a lot of a lot of the countries there are now in trouble. And unfortunately, you know, we just got the, the really sad results of uh, the, the election in Poland. And yet, I would say, look at Poland, right? Look at Poland in 1989. Um, look at a country that you know that had been under martial law for eight years that had, um, that seemed to be just one of the most restrictive and hopeless regimes uh, in the totalitarian space. And not only did it tumble, but we actually saw the peaceful handover of power from a regime that had um, suddenly realized its utter illegitimacy to a group of dissidents uh, both intellectuals and trade union activists who had holding hope against hope been working toward this for more than a decade. And as, as, as troubled as Poland is now, that handover was followed by a quarter century of a thriving political society that reinvented itself. Uh, socially, politically, economically, right? Um, and and you know that that example is one that I'm familiar with that gives me a huge amount of hope in that process, right? The process of reinvention and the uh, and the and the process of, of 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 a society coming together to figure out what it wants to be. Perfect. That's a great note to end on. Um, so thank you both. I think I speak for everyone in saying this. Uh, discussion was exceptional. Um, so again, thank you to both to our wonderful speakers and to all of you in the audience for spending your evening with us and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Please make sure to check out Surviving Autocracy at the link in the chat or visit our website. And thanks again for your time and your support and for spending your evening with us. Have a great night, everyone, and stay well. Thank you. Thank you, but good night. Thank you, Bye. Bye.